Hello, so I'm Emma B from the British Geological Survey. I'm actually also a geographer, not a geologist, although I do work at the Geological Survey. Um, what is Geosocial? Geosocial is uh, a web page, an app application, which at the, is mining social media, in this case Twitter, because it's the simplest one for us to explore with for the moment, um, for what people are talking about on social media regarding hazards, geological hazards. So we've got earthquakes, um, aurora, although that's not technically a hazard, it's the geomagnetic side um, of the aurora that we're interested in here. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions and flooding. Um, it looks back for the past seven days. And we have heat maps to show you where um, people are talking about these different hazards. So in this case, it's uh, earthquake. Um, and those can be also points as well. So the concept is, is why, why are we doing this? Is can this kind of big data, this information, help scientists? Can it help our um, natural hazard sciences learn something new, understand um, natural hazard events uh, more? Can it help understand their impacts? We're moving towards more impact-based modelling in the natural hazard science sciences. So in order to understand impacts, we want more information on impacts. So here are a few tweets that show this. So we, on, on the right there, we're looking at a road that was so dangerous because of a landslide. <coughs> I, I was so scared. So we, we, we're getting something back about, well, this road, we can't really travel down it. Um, on, the, on the other side with the Aurora, we're interested to know whether where we are predicting from our models, the uh, way people can see the Aurora, can they actually see it? Can we verify that using social media data? And also, perhaps we can move into more understanding public perceptions of some of the science we do. And as I said, as a geographer, the where is, is quite important to me. Um, I've spent time at the Met Office in their hazard centre, in their 24-hour 24 oper 24 operation centre. I spent six months working down there. Um, and whilst I was there, it was, it was very acutely aware to me that in the op centre, they're, they're after information. There is that red phone, and there is a red phone that connects, it's actually the BBC, not the um, um, Downing Street, but Downing Street to the, to the op centre. And there's obviously lots of scientists, so they want to know what's, what's happening. They're often remote from the impact areas. On the other side, you have the impact areas, you have the emergency and humanitarian response people, you have um, earth observation, but you also have um, citizens or digital humanitarians can they add anything more to the information that those people in the operation centre have to their hands? So this is, this is one method of providing another instrumentational tool, I guess. Um, many of you will be aware of the Twitter earthquake detection tool. So this is um, using volumes of tweets um, to, to almost like a se seismometer to, to detect where earthquakes have happened. So when there's a big hit... Um, you get a massive volume of tweet and it alerts. And in some areas where there are uh, sparsely instrumented, uh, the areas are sparsely mm. instrumented, um, the Twitter earthquake detection tool seems to be much faster than tradition traditional methods. So it's, it's a complement to the, <coughs> the tool set. So going back to the situational awareness, you know, we want to know what's happening on the ground. We're remote from it. Anyone hazard a guess as to the date? that this image was taken. It's earthquake. So it's showing you tweets about earthquakes. Anyone, any guesses? Yeah. <laughs> the, second of, uh, the 17th of February, we had an earthquake in the UK. And uh, so it's a big red dot over, over the UK. Um, there's also some st stuff going on in Mexico and California as well. So here we go. Some of the tweets that, so this is over in California, um, they're actually talking about Mexico, the earthquake in Mexico, so we can quickly see, okay, so there's, you know, there's not actually an earthquake in California at this time, down in Mexico. Um, bits, t telling us a bit about what they felt, that the building was swaying, so you get a sense of the, sort of the magnitude, perhaps, when you analyse some of this, this information. And then back in the UK... You know, lots of questions as, was, was that an earthquake? So yeah, South Wales, 17th of uh, February, and this is just 
zooming in a bit more so that the map here is from geosocial and it quite nicely depicts where the recorded epicentre was, which is shown on the other, other map there and, and also our BGS uh, macro seismic intensity maps as well. So it's, it's, it's quite, quite a good correlation. Just some uh, more images about, about the South Wales earthquake, sort of the kind of um, text people, things people tweet about. So anyone just, did they feel it? And they give them the location there as well. They did see the walls move, didn't know it was an earthquake, and they've given us, exa again, an example of what it felt like, so, you know, it could be quite useful. <laughs> <laughs> so the situational awareness side is, is, is perhaps another tool set, along with the instrumentation, that's quite, quite useful. Um, just a few weeks back, there was an earthquake in Taiwan, so, again, we've got that map there, and we can see some heat going on, so what, what's happening? What's happening? It's California again. So um, we zoom on in. Yeah, Tyron earthquakes, it's picked it up quite nicely again there. A few tweets about that. Strongest since 2007. So we're starting to get a feel of, you know, what the measure of the earthquake. Instruments can do this, but it's, it's the people, the social sensing side might, might add extra information that we didn't otherwise know. Um, there's other hazards on there. Some, the earthquake one's quite nice because lots of people tweet about earthquakes. If it's happening to you, they, they tweet about it and we can pick it up using very simple text algorithms. Things like landslides become more difficult. People talk about political landslides, so there's a lot of um, trash amongst, <laughs> amongst the nuggets. <laughs> um, this one I've shown is, is I had a look because there was a conference on um, in the Philippines a, a few weeks back, um, and so it's picking up the conference, that's where the conference was happening. So it's, it's, it's not really about a landslide, it's just a conference about landslides occurring. So what we're trying to explore here is whether social media can help us understand more about the extent of a hazard and its impact. So landslides, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions and flooding. Perhaps we should include tsunamis as well. That was, that was some feedback I had a few weeks ago. Um, so where it has happened, when did it happen, who has been affected, what has been affected, and how long will there be a disruption? And for the Aurora, it's more about seeing, uh, is, did my <coughs> scientific model, did, you know, where I predicted people would see it, and therefore we understand the, the, mag, um, the, the geomagnetic effects of it. It, it. Is it where people actually did see it? So again, a few more about the landslides, just... Uh, uh, Often with Twitter, there are pictures as well, so we, we can see here that the road really is not passable. It's, it's not good. So if you have that back in your operation centre, that's quite a, a useful, useful sign. But there are some challenges. So first problem is a computational problem. Um, as this quote says, the proliferation of social media in recent years is presenting substantial computational challenges associated with the management Processing, analysis, and visualization of the corresponding massive volumes of data. That's actually becoming easier, um, but it, it is still a problem. Access to data. So, um, basically, you need to pay to get access to the all tweets available, the fire hose. Otherwise, you, there are limits to the volume of, of matching tweets that Twitter will return. So, we at BGS, the geosocial application, uses the Twitter streaming API. Um, so we receive tweets in near real time, but as long as they match our search query, and it depends on the demand. So periods of high traffic, we won't necessarily get all, all the tweets back. The language problem. At the moment, Geosocial is just looking at English, hence California always coming out really <laughs> massively in those heat maps. Um, only 34% of tweets are in English, um, and these are the top 10 languages on Twitter. So we're missing a lot of languages as well. <laughs> and then when you compare that to most common languages used on the internet, so this isn't Twitter, um, the two in red there aren't Twitter users, for <coughs> example. They, weren't, they didn't feature on the previous slide. So we're missing the whole of China and we're missing Russia. So when we're getting that situational awareness map, we're being biased towards the English language and then we're being biased to the platform users. Um, I have a project in India um, that we're looking at some of this um, technology for in terms of predicting and um, helping to forecast landslides. 
and India is, you know, there's several languages spoken in India, so it, it doesn't work so well. And to highlight it once more, um, when I first started looking at this, it was part of a hackathon um, when I was based at the Met Office. Um, and there was an earthquake. There was an earthquake on the 20th of May uh, in 2012 in Italy. And we put in the word earthquake and nothing came up. We were so disappointed. And then we just thought, oh, let's just change the word. Let's put terremoto, which is the Italian for earthquake. And we got the heat coming out pretty much where the epicenter was matching. So it, that just highlights the language problem um, or the bias in, in the system towards language. Moving on to the other biases. So it does depend on Twitter users. So this, is, this shows you a map of Twitter users by age group. It's mostly the young that are using it. Um, there are, issue, there are um, demogra the demographics of age, gender, income, nationality. It depends on, you know, we're only capturing a, a bias in the population of, of what we're doing here. Bad language. Now, BGS is a public sector um, organisation. We have this website that's looking at Twitter, and we put a disclaimer on saying that, you know, this isn't, these posts aren't ours, and so on. Um, I spent a long time Googling or working with, uh, you, can, you can get these swear word filters that you can put into the system. So we've... Uh, had lots of interesting conversations with our computer system support guys about what we're looking at. Um, but essentially, we try and filter out some of the swear words. However, if you're in an earthquake, oh, cabbages, I felt an earthquake, <laughs> is potentially quite useful. So again, we're filtering and being a bit biased here. Um, the semantic problem, the meaning. So I talked, touched a bit about landslides. Um, extracting meaning from these large, messy... Uh, data sets is perhaps the biggest problem. So landslides, with, with, you know, we're talking about political landslides here. We quite often get the Oasis lyric coming up. Um, <laughs> and you try and filter these out, but it, yeah, they keep coming back. Um, again, with the Aurora, we, the ones in the red there are, are sort of some of the things we get. And we're not interested in those. We have to des describe the problem. And, and we're moving on to machine learning here. What What text means something to this application. There's also the fake news problem, you know, is, is what we're displaying, is, is it rumour, hearsay, or is it actually real? I um, don't know how we really tackle that one with this application at the moment, but it's something that we have to be aware of when using this system. Um, the location problem. So only around 1% of all tweets are accurately, accurately geotagged. Um, so we have an example here of... Um, UK, they're talking about something that's happening, landslide happening um, in Sri Lanka. So it's geotagged, but it's not really where I want it to geotag it to. Um, and it is just 1% of tweets. So we, again, we've got a, a bias really here. Whilst uh, you can use Google Maps geocoding API, there you go, um, to get some of the addresses back, um, that, and that's, that's great, we can, we can do that. Um, and there are algorithms developed by IBM which can predict home, people's <coughs> home location based on the last 200 tweets with 70% accuracy. I have a slight issue with some of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's quite a few film stars in California, I think, whose home locations have been revealed based on their last 200 tweets, and people have gone to their houses. Um, yeah, I don't want to cause, I don't want geosocial to cause a sort of gold rush, if you like, people swarming to a location. Um, which brings me quite nicely onto what I call sort of the ethics problem. And I've, I've spent quite a lot of time um, pondering this because, and it's probably hindered me developing this application further up until now, until I've sort of sorted this out in my head, really. Because whilst this data is publicly available, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because we can use it, we should use it. I think as a researcher, or researchers um, in academic institutes particularly, we need to just be mindful of how we use this data and how we display it. So you'll have noticed I've read, out, read inked out all the tweet han Twitter handles and so on. People have a right to be forgotten. So if they put in a request to Twitter, delete my account, and I'm still showing you know, their tweets up on, online, that's, that's not really fair, I don't think. 
we have, a, we have an obligation to do no harm as researchers. Um, the example with the, uh, here is the US Army in uh, 2007 had posted loads of geotagged photos on their Facebook of where they were located. And as a result, the, uh, the enemy, uh, they were in Iraq at the time, the enemy shot down four helicopters um, because they were able to identify where the army was located. So again, I think we have an obligation to, to think about doing no harm. I'm not even going to try and pronounce those words up there, um, but essentially it means do no harm. Also, it's important to respect the rules of the platform owner. Twitter has ever-changing developer rules. It's really hard to keep on top of. Um, there are rules about sharing, storing, accessing, and presenting data. And I think, again, as a public sector organisation, um, we need to do respect as much as we can those rules. So what this has boiled down to, to me, is to make sure that I have an ethics policy to do with how we work with this data. And I've, I've put some key points here. I'm not expecting you to read this. It's just to demonstrate that we thought about how we display this data, how we... How we um, work with this data and it, it makes me feel now much more comfortable in coming to talk to you guys about what we're doing to be honest so what next um, apply machine learning algorithms Ed's talked about this a little bit already but it, essentially we want to improve those nuggets of information that we're interested in and filter out all the all the rubbish um, that we're not interested in and we need to do this automatically by classifying tweets that are relevant based on their, cont uh, their content or sentiment um, to obtain more relevant data. Um, some papers here on, on suggested ways to do it. So we're looking at um, algorithms such as support vector machine on your network. We also want to use big data tools as sort of uh, parallel processing. So there's some other example here. Um, I've put a picture up of this lady because it, she's the clever computer scientist um, that, that does some of this. And I think it's, um, from a geological survey perspective, we need to embrace and work more with the computer scientists. We, we have the problems, and they, they have the ability to, to, to really work with this data in the way <coughs> that we want to. Um, and it's, it's been really useful working with someone um, like Rosa um, to just uncover what we can do. Um, so one, one of the things we want to do, when you use machine learning um, techniques, you need to train your data set. You need to tell it, tell the computer, well, these, these are kind of, this is the text we're interested in, and these are the, these are the rubbish. Um, so crowdsourcing has opportunities there, and Aurorasaurus is an American application, and they've got heaps of yes, no, this is a relevant tweet about Aurora, this isn't. So we're currently trying to work with them to develop the machine learning algorithm for the Aurora aspect of geosocial. So my conclusions, um, I think there are opportunities for social media mining to add value to research in the geosciences. Um, to realise the value, we really need to work with data scientists or develop the skills ourselves to, to handle some of this data and not be scared of it. Um, personally, I think we must... <coughs> be mindful and continually be mindful about the ethics of some of this research and working. I think, again, just because it is there, we should just, should we, should we do this? Um, do the principle of do no harm. Social media mining is just one tool and should be used alongside others to ensure reliability. I would never profess that you use geosocial above and beyond any other uh, scientific instruments or information it's just an, a, another tool to put in the in the toolbox really so thank you very much for listening